are back live here in The Hague for the next part of our Eurojust Virtual Open Day 2021. As you can see, we have made some changes here in uh, the setup. I am uh, joined by a number of colleagues here and I would like to introduce them to you one by one with a very quick uh, tour de table. And um, I would like to ask my co colleagues one question and um, please answer this question in just one sentence. Um, let's start with Klaus. Klaus Meyer Cabri is here with us today. Um, he's the national member for Germany and one of the two vice presidents of Eurojust. Klaus, please, how would you describe Eurojust in just one sentence? Let me uh, answer that with a famous quote from... Sorry. Let me answer that with a famous quote from Allo Allo, the famous British comedy. Um, and you can say that... Uh, Listen very carefully. I will say this only once. Prosecutors, if you want to work internationally, here is help. Here is your adjust. Thank you. And uh, we also welcome from the German desk as well, the deputy national member, Selina Ganesco. She is vice chair of the counterterrorism team. Selina, what brought you to Eurojust in just one sentence? <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Tim, for this very interesting question. Um, for me, it was that I could uh, combine um, my experience as a prosecutor exactly with uh, working internationally, which is a very unique uh, opportunity that you just provide. Thank you. That was one sentence. Thank you. Also with us today, Bostian Lamesic, who is the deputy national member for Slovenia and the vice chair of our economic crime team. Bostian, in one sentence, what made you choose a career in law? Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for in inviting me. Uh, why I choose law? Uh, since I was a little kid, I really loved books. I love sports. And in high school, I was somehow hesitant what, to which university to go, whether uh, to become a journalist or to try to apply for a police academy. But then after some consideration, I thought that the law combines all of them. That's why I chose law. Thank you, Bostia. Clear motivation. Um, we also happy to have to, uh, to have Teresa Magno with us. She's assistant to the national member for Italy, and she's the vice chair of the cybercrime team. So a difficult question for you, Teresa, especially difficult to answer in uh, just one sentence, but please uh, give it a try. What is justice for you? Um, I'm happy you recognize it's difficult. Yeah, being a judge, um, I would say that uh, justice means delivering the uh, fairest possible decision on the basis of the evidence that's provided to you and in full respect of the rights of the people that are in front of you, being them the defendants, the suspects and the victims. Well, impressive. One sentence. I think some a topic we could uh, discuss now about for uh, two hours, three hours, two days, but uh, <laughs> indeed. Thanks. And last but certainly not least, we also welcome Joanna van Newkirk. Uh, she is Judicial Cooperation Advisor in our casework unit, and she's working with our anti-trafficking team. Joanna, what do you like most about working at Eurojust? Uh, thank you, team. Uh... Uh, Eurojust is um, for me like the heart of cooperation between prosecutors, um, not only from Europe but from all over the world. And I love the international uh, atmosphere here and all the tasks I perform every day, working with colleagues from 37 countries and feeling like uh, I'm attending an exchange program every day. Um, which opens my mind, makes me more uh, understanding, tolerant, flexible. Um, I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you very much, Joanna. And thanks a lot to all of you. Um, I think by now we have heard uh, quite a number of uh, very uh, personal statements, personal answers. We have also heard personal stories in the previous session. But now it's time to have a look at our actual work. So what are we doing at Eurojust to support the national member states, national authorities, member states of the European Union in their work, uh, in their fight against crime? Um, we would like to start with one important aspect here. I mean, we are helping them to serve justice. Service, serving justice also means um, it is served in the interest of victims of crimes. 
Um, Klaus, you are representing Eurojust in a rather new body that is called the EU Victims' Rights Platform. Um, first of all, be before we talk about the platform itself, um, what precisely are these victims' rights? You have to see, Tim, that the European Union has a new flagship policy that is concentrating on the rights of victims of crime to protect them better in the exercise of their rights. Uh, victims should be understood here uh, in a broader sense. It's not only those who are directly affected by a crime, but as well their families, their relatives. Uh, I'll give you a concrete example where Euro just dealt with these issues. That was the terrible crash of the German wings plane. Uh, the direct victims, of course, were all dead, but we had to deal a lot with the victims' families. How do they get their information? What happened? How is the uh, uh, when, where, what is about compensation? All these issues we could dealt here with. In a given case, very often the prosecutor, our chief clients, I would say, are in the lead of the investigation and therefore in the lead to protect as well the rights of victims. What we want to avoid, that the victim, already a victim through the crime itself, becomes a, again a victim through the process. Often the crime victims are the chief witnesses, so unfortunately there is no way that you can avoid to be in the system, in the proceedings, but there are ways of doing it better immediate protection after the crime. So there's the interlink with the uh, police, which because the police is very often the first port of call if something happens, need to be involved. Uh, Long-term damages needs to be taken into account. Um, we had uh, only yesterday reports about um, um, the investigations and uh, the court proceedings against uh, Nazis who had been done terrible things during the Second World War. And in the legal proceedings, the children, the relatives of these vic victims who uh, were killed in concentration camps had a place in the legal proceedings. And this is something which you need to do. Think about um, terrorist attacks. Berlin, Christmas Market, Brussels, Paris, Madrid. All these uh, happenings do not affect only the direct victims, but as well their families and the long-term damages caused by these terrible uh, happenings. And all this can be filtered in into our work in our so-called coordination meetings where we can give them appropriate consideration and this sorry uh, to, to to finish that f is now going to be on a much broader um, uh, uh, space in the european union that is all combined from all different angles um, to have a harmonized approach how you will be dealing with the crime victims. I think now with that we have arrived at the EU Victims' Rights Platform. Uh, what precisely is this platform and what what is the difference to uh, how we dealt with victims' rights before in the European Union? The key element here is that you combine every aspect of it. You give it a drive from the European Union. It's not just in a given case but you do it generally, systematically, and broadly. And this is the huge advantage. And on top, which you usually uh, need in every kind of new approach, you have a driver. And this platform ensures there is a driver so that the key policy 
this flagship policy of the European Union is not just nice talking, but will boil down in new legislation. And, and who's, who is part of that uh, platform, who, uh, apart from Eurojust? <laughs> everyone dealing with these issues uh, in, in a broader sense, all kinds of agencies who have knowledge about these things. Um, the national authorities will be involved. And of course, we have uh, an EU coordinator running these platforms. And that is, that is the key. You bring together all actors who can improve the situation for victims in the European Union. And um, how is Eurojust now concretely contributing to this platform? First of all, um, we have, through our daily work, and for example, Joanna here has pulled uh, uh, together reports on certain issues of this work, um, THB, for example. Uh, we inform the colleagues about it. We ourselves change our habits on this, our uh, workings, um, and we give insight into the given cases and what general ideas for better legislation can be drawn from this. So it helps the legislator and those who are drafting it uh, to have a better understanding, to see problems, especially cross-border cases, like the cases I mentioned ha have all cross-border elements, which need to be uh, taken into account. Nowadays, as crime is cross, um, has no borders, so the criminal proceedings must be borderless in a sense that n through a border, especially a victim, is not disadvantaged. And this is the key element why we contributed to help in a cross-border situation uh, the, to have the right things. For example, in, um, in, uh, in Spain, the system for crime victims protection is very elaborate, but it could mean in, in, if in, in any given case, a, a victim is in another state and they don't react to certain Spanish uh, uh, demands for information or participation, that the whole criminal investigation is halted, is brought to a standstill. And through us, we can ensure that this doesn't happen, that the right information flows, and that the Spanish authorities do get what they need to continue. They do not hold the investigation because they are just lazy. No, because they want to ensure that the rights of the victim is properly in the system. So it is important that the information flow does take place and everyone can exercise its rights. And here we, are, we give a helping hand. And to bring this all together, from a human rights aspect. Uh, so we have the FRA uh, in, in Vienna who can help here. All this needs to be pulled together and through the case law we have, we could give general ideas what problems have occurred, how were they solved, and whether we could bring that on a level of systematic general approach. Indeed, um, Klaus, let's, let's talk a little bit about our casework. Let's bring in Joanna von Newkirk here. Joanna, uh, you are often working on cases uh, involving trafficking in human beings, so THB cases uh, that, uh, that Klaus already mentioned. Um, these cases can be for, for sexual exploitation, for example, or for labor explo exploitation as well. Um, very recently, Euro just worked on such a case. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, uh, indeed. Um, in September, we had a few um, actions uh, supported by Eurojust, and last week um, there was uh, um, an action day, a joint action day to arrest suspects and save victims uh, in two countries, uh, Romania and the United Kingdom. Um, and this day was, um, let's say, uh, the end of work of more than two years, um, two investigations in these two countries supported by Eurojust uh, since 2019, 
uh, investigation into um, trafficking of men, uh, more than 80 victims, um, for labor exploitation. So these victims were um, asked to work in extremely um, uh, poor conditions and uh, their uh, papers were, uh, the ID papers were taken by the organized criminal group. Uh, they had to work very long hours and they were working without any payment. Uh, they were subject to aggression and uh, often they had to feed themselves from garbage bins because there was no food for them. Um, so this exploitation actually started in 2015 and the judicial cooperation between authorities in Romania and the UK um, started uh, to, to, to dismantle this group. So last week what happened after a joint investigation team supported by Eurojust uh, cooperating, exchanging evidence uh, on the place of exploitation, on the situation of victims, um, went uh, for searches. So we conducted uh, 15 searches uh, on the 28th of September uh, with support from Eurojust uh, to um, arrest um, uh, and seize uh, money and uh, 18 suspects were identified, 11 of them are charged uh, and more than 50 victims were actually uh, saved from uh, domin uh, dominance. Um, and. Um, so what would you say in in such cases um what is the what is the added value of eurojust what brings what does eurojust bring to the table to help in these cases yes um eurojust uh, as klaus just said is the helping hand so there are two investigations in two countries um and they need to um they need to to speak to each other they need to act very fast um victims many times are moved from one place to another one and if we use uh, um, uh, Eurojust this can be done faster. We can meet here and discuss, um, we exchange the evidence here, we discuss the prosecution strategy, uh, we take into consideration all the um, legal and practical issues in the case, the differences between national legislation which need to be addressed uh, before uh, we are uh, going to go bring the case to court. Um, and we look at uh, the victim's uh, situation and which, uh, which jurisdiction should best be placed to prosecute. Um, um, and we, we uh, help in the last day of action to, to, um, to be there and search and uh, execute exec uh, European investigation orders, European arrest warrants, to to um, to to have a successful case. Yeah, sure, Klaus, please. What um, Joanna just described leads actually to what Teresa asked us to do: justice. Because otherwise, you would miss an angle. Maybe then the authorities in one country only do what is in their country. The other ones only what is in their country. But the real crime is broader. The judgment will be then, of course, if we don't cooperate, limited to the little bits. So they get, if they found guilty, less of a punishment, while their crime is so much bigger. And this is why your just contributes to, uh, to, to achieve real justice. Mm -hmm. um, Klaus, uh, one thing that is also, of course, important to, to keep in mind is that uh, we all can become victims of crimes, even in, in very everyday situations. Um, for example, if we, if we turn on our computers or take our smartphones and we, we order something on the internet, we can all f fall victim to, to cybercrime. Um, this is something that Teresa Magno and her team, uh, the, the cybercrime team, are actually working on. Teresa, what is the special challenge when it comes to fighting cybercrime? 
First, I have to say that you just told something that I wanted to say, meaning that every any, any of us can be a victim of cybercrime. So any of us has to be very careful uh, when answering emails or even checking the SMS that we receive at our business phone. So yeah, there are so many challenges, uh, but it's also the nice part of it. So um, the challenges uh, relate to this crime being very uh, transnational. As uh, our vice president was saying, we um, can't miss the full picture. Uh, and um, what starts, for example, as a simple investigation in Italy, then spans all over the world. And the Italian prosecutor has to come here to, to Eurojust in order to uh, ask for cooperation from uh, colleagues from other states, being them uh, EU states, states of the European Union, or first states. That's quite normal. This is, I mean, the uh, uh, normal job we, we do. But at the same time, um, I have to say that this, uh, the challenge is that uh, it's so widespread that we need to have the appropriate tool to address it. And Eurojust can provide such tools. But um, apart from the tools, I would also like to come back a little bit uh, to, to what our vice president was saying about the um, information flows. That That's the key, because people come here, our colleagues come here, because we uh, they trust uh, each other and we were able to, to build such a trustworthy environment so that they feel secure to exchange information here, to talk uh, quite directly about factual problems, but also legal problems that can be very, very difficult to solve. So they try to address them here. And usually I, I think that they solve even them here. But then, um, I mean, uh, what we can also provide is um, a, uh, f um, a very comprehensive support that enables them to recognize the international, transnational dimension of their cases, which is something that it's not immediately clear from, from their job. So this is why we are also yeah, here to, to help them. Sort of connecting the dots there, finding, mm -hmm. finding, yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, is it, I mean, if you follow the media uh, and, and, and you look at uh, all those uh, reports, articles about uh, cybercrime, we hear a lot about, for example, malware, about botnets, about ransomware. Is this uh, also a part of your uh, daily work on cases? Is this some, are these cases that Eurojust is actively working on? Yeah, it's exactly what we were referring to before. Uh, this is what we deal with, uh, all these kind of malicious programs. Uh, and um, I mean, this can happen to any of us sitting at this table because uh, it's simply getting a malicious uh, malware. Uh, a malicious program, which is a malware, you can call it malware, for example, but also uh, it has other, other names, Trojan or Worms, whatever. But then what is the effect? The effect is that your device is controlled by someone else and you are not even aware of it and they can steal everything from you. I mean, uh, um, any kind of personal information can be stolen. Your uh, banking uh, access codes can be stolen. Yeah, and this is what, what, what we see also. And then uh, the, the big issue is also the one related to the um, uh, ransom uh, say, uh, things, meaning that uh, they uh, steal your data because they, they want money. And what is specific, I think, about cybercrime is that the, the purpose for committing these crimes can be uh, very different because it's not only um, economic uh, gain that they want to make, it's also that they want to steal something from you in order to commit crimes, but also disrupt, for example, uh, sensitive infrastructure of states. This is also something that we are experiencing at Eurojust. And it's something that we have also experienced during the pandemic, as far as the NHS systems is concerned. Concerned. So these attacks that have been performed against um, health structures to, to block them, but it's not only health structures. So this is yeah a new dimension of this uh, of these crimes, which is very very uh, challenging, but also dangerous. So so we see that there are different motivations behind such uh, such crimes. But you said also that that 
in, in principle, also economic motives and motivations are um, also a big part of it, right? So, um, it's, yeah. I, when I think of ransomware yeah, cases, yeah. I mean, exactly. this is, Ransom. of course, what, yeah, it's extortion, basically. And um, when we talk about um, this economic um, uh, element, uh, we see that this is a strong driving force to commit some such crimes. Uh, we have Bostian Lamesic with here us today. Um, he's the vice chair of our economic crime team. Um, Bostian, I guess that at the end of the day, most of our cases are in some way uh, connected uh, to some economic component making gain because essentially they are about money right oh for sure crime has no borders no does the human greed so we are also trying to prevent this a little bit i will just briefly explain you three cases so the audience will know what kind of help do we give them i remember uh, once a young prosecutor from slovenia during the trial she contacted Eurojust in order to obtain some uh, legislation from uh, Poland. Uh, by simply walking to the doors to our Polish colleague, he provided us uh, Polish provisions in uh, Polish language and also unofficial translation in English language. So we, during the trial, we provided the answer to our prosecutor who could then, on the same date, within a couple of hours, end her case. And then in the second case, I remember there was a, also one prosecutor from Slovenia who was involved, who dealt with money laundering case, but uh, he had some leads that there are some bank accounts in Japan, but he had no idea how to continue. Uh, that's why, again, he contacted Eurojust, but luckily at Eurojust we have, I think, 58 contact points all across the globe. So we contacted our Japanese colleagues in order to find out what would be the best way in order that these colleagues would get the bank account numbers. Uh, within six months, our colleague in Slovenia got the bank account numbers. And also in one third case, uh, I think it was also some tax evasion. A uh, Slovenian prosecutor needed some evidence from Estonia. In order to get this evidence, he needs to write a letter of request. But he had a problem because there are no translators to Estonian language in Slovenia. So he approached us. But again, Euro just managed to help him because uh, we can provide the translations to our prosecutors. So again, within a couple of months, he got the requested data. So yeah, there we, there we can see that, uh, that uh, as we don't uh, speak a common language in, in the European Union, it can always uh, can, can, uh, can be of very, very big effect if we uh, provide uh, even such services that um, on, on, on first uh, view appear relatively simple, but they, they can be crucial in, in such uh, prosecution cases, right? Um, so um, one very specific type uh, crime type that is not directly connected to economic uh, motivation, but more to uh, uh, to a sort of uh, ideology, is of course terrorism. Um, um, we have with us today uh, Selina Ganescu from our counter-terrorism team. Um, which services or which tools does Eurojust provide in that field? Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, as you just said, this uh, crime is uh, ideologically based and um, it also has no borders. Um, on the contrary, the borders are becoming, you know, like invisible almost because also these uh, type of structures and organizations, they, um, they work you know internationally they combine internationally via the internet and everything so also there for our prosecutors national prosecution offices it's extremely crucial to find the links and also to have Eurojust support so it goes in the same direction a little bit of what my colleague said but also here the chance that Eurojust provides to discuss very sensitive and highly confidential matters in a trustful and safe environment is the key is the key issue here i think um for us, I'm also working at the at the German desk on terrorist cases. Um, for me, it's always important that my authorities, my national authorities, they feel safe and secure, and they do because they trust us, and we trust our colleagues. And so the the, the chain of trust is, you know, like um, guarding us more or less. So in these sensitive cases that they sometimes need coordination with one day to the other, we can make it happen that they can come here, they will find translation. Um, so they can all speak in this very specific field. And when you have the legal, you know, terminology, it's quite specific. So for the prosecutors, it's also important that they can really speak precise about the issues at hand. And if they have translation that 
tremendously helps them to to come here and to to find what they are looking for so trust is a, a key word basically in everything we do um you you have one specific tool um or we at euro just provide one specific tool uh, it's called the ctr the counter terrorism register the judicial counter terrorism mm -hmm. register can you um explain us a little bit more about that specific tool mm -hmm. yeah this tool was uh, created i think it went into start in september 2019 and it basically means that all terrorist investigations no matter in which state they are from a procedural point of view are being reported to eurojust with the parameters we need to give also with this tool the support they need which means basically we can do cross matches. So with the um, personal data being reported to us, the, the system does automatic searches for links. So within one hour, if needed, it can be that we find a link between an investigation that takes place, let's say in Germany and one that takes place in France. And maybe the national prosecutors working on these cases, they had even no idea that they were maybe investigating against the same suspect or other you know people involved in that investigation and um this is this is a tremendous asset of course as well mm -hmm. um how is this instrument again it's something about connecting the dots right it's uh, it, it's basically what we also heard from from joanna one of these very important functions of eurojust of connecting dots in very different uh, investigations that may be spread over the whole continent or sometimes even over the whole world we find those dots and we bring them together um is, is this um, this instrument, this counter-terrorism uh, register, how do you see uh, its future? So how should it be developed in the, in the years to come? Is there room for improvement? Um, well, probably there's always room for improvement, as is usually with things. But I think what is very important is that we have to keep in mind that our national prosecutors, they have a very high workload and they do excellent work. So I think it has to be extremely, let's call it user friendly. It needs to be manageable for them that they report to us only what is needed. We do not want to create something that has like, you know, that we want, don't want to create a life of its own. It needs to be the tool they, that they need in order to ensure correct prosecution. And of course, um, in that field, of course, to ensure Europe's safety as well, mm. right? So, um, I would like to come back to the starting point of our uh, discussion, to the element of victims' rights. Um, Klaus Mayakari, we have now heard about all these different crime types, which all come with their own um, challenges, but they all have one thing in common, people fall victim to these crimes, basically. Um, of course, the first step, I think, is uh, always to prevent those uh, crimes from happening. But if they have happened, um, we have to make sure that the victims get the rights they deserve. Looking into the future, Klaus, what, what do you think? Uh, can, what can Eurojust do better and what can the European Union do better? Let's start with a more practical aspect of it, um, because we have um, our existing tools. And we could use these existing tools more targeted to victims' rights. Um, we have our coordination meetings. And uh, before these coordination meetings, there's a prep meeting, which we call... So, ju sorry, uh, just to explain the coordination meeting, for those of you not familiar with this term, is when prosecutors from all over Europe, basically, they come together to yes. discuss a case. Yeah, exactly. This is, a ho however, prepared by the national desks here. They, they meet before. Um, set up agendas and what I would like to see is that we have always at least in this prep meeting a dedicated point victim rights and probably even take it further to the proper coordination meeting is there anything particular we need to address when it comes to victims uh, on the European Union uh, level I hope there will be new legislation uh, there is a directive, which is a bit old-fashioned. It's a directive, which means uh, it's not it's binding in goals, but not in, in concrete terms. So I actually hope for a regulation, uh, which will then ensure a systematic Europe-wide system how victims' rights should be protected. And I hope this will be on a high level. Uh, not going to the bottom level, but get everyone up to the highest speed. 
Uh, and if you have been ever a, vi a crime victim, uh, I have been several times, uh, I know what I'm talking about. And there you need to have this kind of protection. And not become a second time a victim through the process. The process should be helpful to you. And there are a lot of possibilities. But make no mistake, you need to invest. It will cost. Justice is not on the cheap. And we have seen time and again over the years that the police and the judiciary seems to be those parts where you can actually save money instead of investing money. And perpetrators are often, especially if you look at organized crime, uh, high technical and this the judicial systems of the eu member states must be as well these kind of strange fax machines running are still in operation uh, you wonder why <laughs> because uh, and on all this needs to be properly funded this is as well the agencies doing these works need properly funded this doesn't come cheap but it's important for the citizen, for the justice and safety of European citizens. Um, let me come in here with a question from our audience, uh, because you said um, it's, it's important that, that we and it's important that the national authorities keep up with, uh, with the criminals and with their technological advancement. Um, there's a question, uh, Teresa, for you. Um, is there, I mean, there are cyber criminals and uh, are there also cyber prosecutors? And a second question, does Eurojust work virtually or online or only with in-person meetings during this pandemic situation now? Okay, there are prosecutors who are cyber prosecutors uh, in the sense that they uh, are specialized in investigating uh, cyber crimes. Of course, um, at least uh, as far as I know, in Italy we have them. Um, because it's a specific competence that's uh, enshrined in the law. Um, as far as the coordination meetings is concerned, during the pandemic, we worked uh, as everyone, I think, uh, at, at home, but we had the facilities to um, uh, go on organizing coordination meetings online, so a distance. Uh, now we are coming back to normal, which means that prosecutors and judges, uh, because also investigative judges from France and Spain can join uh, the meetings, so they are coming in person, in flesh. So we are going back to normal. Thank you, Teresa. We have uh, received another question, um, a question for Joanna, actually. It's a uh, it's related to your work uh, on, on uh, uh, trafficking cases, uh, trafficking in human beings. Um, the question is, uh, you, are, you are often dealing, uh, as we have heard, with, with terrible cases, with people where people are really subjected to, um, to, to violence and to, to very bad living conditions or they are exploited. How do you deal with that personally if you, if you have such, a, such terrible details you learn about in your work? Uh, thank you for this question, uh, which is not easy to answer because uh, indeed uh, in uh, my daily work I have to um, experience a situation when um, information um, about the victims, uh, such as um, images of um, children being abused sometimes by their own parents, um, heavy conversation between pedophiles uh, related to uh, child abuse, um, images of victims with um, terrible physical handicaps which are forced to beg uh, for prolonged hours uh, to, to show their handicap and, and, and get uh, more money for organized groups. So all these images, all this conversation, all these videos that uh, are exchanged here at Eurojust, um, I, I do have to, to, to see them and um, it's difficult to cope with, to go home and uh, not take this uh, heaviness on your shoulders, how I sometimes have to rely on psychological support. Um, but uh, someone has to do it and I'm glad that I'm part of a team at Eurojust who helps to make a little contribution that 
these images are exchanged and based on this we can identify the victims. We can uh, ask for protection measures when we see that aggression is used, coercion. Um, we, we can put the authorities together uh, to, um, to have uh, this as a priority point for discussion, as Klaus just said, in each and every case to see, first of all, what can we do for the victims? Um, and sometimes we have to see all these images and conversations because this is evidence. This is what goes later on to court and we have to decide here if it's admissible as evidence in the country. So, um, yes, uh, this is distressing, but is uh, for a good cause. We are bringing justice to victims here and um, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to be part of Eurojust. <laughs> Thank you. And um, let's stay a little bit with this, uh, with the victims. Um, we, we got a question for Klaus. Um, questions are really uh, freely flowing in now. Uh, so um, Klaus, one of these questions is um, how challenging is it to harmonize the approach to victims uh, on a European level if there are different definitions as to what constitutes a victim? For example, some countries uh, see irregular migrants as victims of traffickers, while others would not. Um, what are approaches to find compromises on this? Um, this is, of course, a million dollar question. Um, I think we, we, we need uh, first to be precise what we want. Um, the question relates to migration. This is not about migration. Mm -hmm. The issues of why people do migrate, why do they come, uh, but that they are exploited in this endeavor. Our target are the migrant smugglers. They are the perpetrators. The migrants are victims in many ways, in their home countries, about the political, economic, or social, or whatever conditions, um, and they are exploited in their way to look for uh, uh, a better life. So by defining clearly where we are want to go and how we protect vulnerable people, we are usually talking about vulnerable people, uh, then you find probably a way forward. The important issue here is because we are in the beginning of a process and I would say probably a long process is that we do push for that we do not get disheartened uh, by problems different approaches bringing them first together to to have what we call this sounds terribly uh, bureaucratic a mapping exercise but it, this clearly shows where are differences why are these differences then comes of course the financing aspect all this needs to be pulled together and brought together into a harmonized way forward. And I think the best way is actually uh, it being done by Brussels, new proposals on the table, and the discussion starts. So I'm, I'm not disheartened actually, uh, because there might be problems, different approaches. Yes, we do know. We do know this from, from our uh, uh, daily work. But maybe, as a, as a starting point, let's concentrate for a time as well what we have in common. And I would say 80%, 85%, even 90% in our work is more or less the same. We often concentrate very much on the differences. But in our daily work where we bring people together from all over Europe with our cooperation partners and even beyond that, we see there is a lot in common which we can harvest and bring to a coordinated uh, whole. And that we should do as well uh, if we have new legislation. Not just uh, say, oh, there are differences and then everything is so difficult. No, there's a lot in common and built on the common approaches already existing. Okay, thank you. I think that's a 
clear uh, appeal, clear message. Um, we are now jumping a little bit from uh, from very high level uh, discussions to very practical, very concrete questions um, that uh, also come flowing in from your side. Um, one of these questions goes to uh, Bostian. Do victims of economic crimes get their money back when the criminals are arrested? Well, according to my experience, I think in 90% they don't. Uh, but there are definitely ways if uh, prosecutors manage to seize the funds, then they get it. I think now with the new freezing order, this is also a little bit easier for the victims. There is a special article, I think, number 27. I think uh, one month ago we had a nice case with our German colleagues where our uh, where Slovenian court requested some seizing of funds in Germany and uh, Netherlands and uh, according to the new legislation the victims got the funds back but I really have to admit that there are really not that much of cases where the victims get it back or where the money is seized especially in cybercrime cases nowadays with the use of bitcoins and you, you cannot even know where to start to look for the money yeah sure please Teresa yeah uh, yes it's true maybe i can complement and saying that uh, we have some positive experiences in italy in recovering assets what is difficult is to find the money uh, but there are instruments to do it and uh, as far as i know maybe the uh, possibility to um, trace bitcoins which is something that we are uh, the european legislator is thinking about thinking about now can help so definitely there are tools uh, we also have some tools in the national legislation which might help but i think that the the main issue here to tackle yeah it does not mm, deal with the legal problems because i think that at least from my uh, coming from my jurisdiction we can try uh, to solve them we have some some ideas solutions and tools but it's uh, the, the the reality we have to be able to find uh, the money where they are and this is uh, the the challenge i think Klaus, you also wanted to come in here. This is um, more a remark now to the potential victims who might be listening or prosecutors. Just because it's difficult and the money might be God knows where on, on this earth, don't stop to, to report it to the police, to the public prosecution office. And prosecutors do explore the avenues. Try it. Give it a try. Just because it seems to be quite impossible in the beginning doesn't mean it, it's in the end. So give it a try. There are two kinds of procedure. One is criminal procedure, so I think the victims will not get the money in the criminal procedure. But if they go to the civil procedure, they can definitely file a lawsuit. And in that case, they might get the money from the perpetrator. Okay, thank you. Um, a question to Celine. Um, Celine, the, is it possible for Eurojust um, or for prosecutors in general, but also for Eurojust in, in supporting prosecutors, to prevent terrorism in the future? It's, it's a difficult one. Um, it's a difficult question and I cannot answer it in an, like a general way, of course. I think with the help of Eurojust, terrorist attacks can be prevented for sure, because uh, prosecutors working in this field, they do not always work on the case when an attack, for example, has happened. They most often work in cases when they are groups being observed that they might plan something. And um, we have cases where we support them, for example, not only with the coordination meetings, but also with the tool that uh, Joanna has mentioned before with the joint investigation teams. So in a case, um, Can you quickly explain what such a joint investigation team is? For yes, of course. So in a case where, um, let's say, very urgent action is needed from police and uh, law enforcement um, agencies and things like this, and when they know that this will continue for a little while and the countries have each their own investigation, they can form a sort of contract which is not as bureaucratic as it sounds now, but it's like, a, it's like a cooperation contract on how these two prosecution offices want to work together internationally, which makes a judicial 
international judicial cooperation a lot easier for them because they can they can request to have certain measures performed in the other country without having to write um, European investigation orders, which would usually be the correct tools to do that. So that that is out because they have the the legal framework of the joint investigation team agreement that allows them to work. And um, with this, I have seen from my practice that if needed, these joint um, investigation teams, they can be founded in really very short amount of time, like extremely short amount. I don't want to go into details, but it can happen. And that really gives them a lot of support and help. And I have seen that um, by forming these joint investigation teams, sometimes um, groups, they could be, you know, let's say uh, arrested and found and their um, activities disrupted before something further could happen. And these uh, these joint investigation teams, I, I think it's um, important to stress that this is, uh, of course, a tool that we use in, in all sorts of uh, crimes, in all crime types. It's not uh, just related to trafficking in human beings or terrorism. It's a, it's a tool that we use for, for basically everything uh, that we do here. So w whether it's, uh, we, we see, uh, we check if it's appropriate and then we, we uh, support such a team or we help to set it up. Mm -hmm. And we support it also financially, right? Yes, exactly. It's being used in all kinds of criminal fields. It is not linked to like sp one specific crime group or a crime type. And um, Eurojust helps in establishing the JIT agreements as well, because sometimes you have very experienced prosecutors who know exactly what that is about and they know exactly what to do, but sometimes you don't. And then we help them because we have experience. We have even model agreements in all the languages of the member states, which is extremely helpful. And then we can guide the prosecutors. That's what we do. And and yeah, you're very right. Um, you're just also funds activities of the joint investigation team. Mm -hmm. We got a question that is basically that, that we could direct to all of you. Um, maybe the first to raise his hand or her hand uh, will be the one to answer, or the, the, the person who doesn't look uh, the other way fast enough. Um, do you see a big difference in your professional work from when you worked at national level compared to now working at Eurojust? So now I'm looking, yeah, please, Teresa, thank you. I think that I will only start and then the colleagues might, uh, will go on. So more than a difference, I see a complementarity uh, because uh, now uh, uh, any kind, I would say that um, the, the evidence is changing. So the evidence that is brought to judges and mm, to to decide and prosecutor have to collect before is mm, is different because it's electronic and it will be uh, more so in the future. So we are assisting to a completely shift of paradigm. I, I hope uh, I'm saying this in a clear way as far as the crimes are concerned, but also the kind of evidence that has to be given to the judges. So electronic evidence is worthless. You don't know where to locate it in a physical way. So you have to resort to instruments that were uh, not used before because they were not necessary. This is why I'm seeing that the national judge uh, needs to, to get uh, cooperation from other judges, so prosecutors from other prosecutors. And in this way, I say this, the um, natural complementary feature of being uh, a national uh, judicial authority. Thank you. Klaus? I would fully subscribe to what Teresa has said uh, in terms of complementarity. What you have to see the difference is in, in the national office, you do investigate. Here, we cooperate with the goal of a coordinated approach. And we do support this. The national prosecutor remains the master of proceedings. He or she still decides what will be done. But we can give them a helping hand. We can show them avenues to go, which they might have not seen before. So it is on top. Knowing about our national system helps us to understand what they do need and where the national part is maybe looking too narrow. And this is what Teresa described as complementary. We do not push us into it, but they come to us because they want to listen to our advice. 
They want the advice. And this is maybe our soft power, but sometimes soft power is much more powerful than full power. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, thanks, Klaus. If we can stay with you uh, at this moment, and we, we got a question um, on the uh, EU Victims' Rights Directive. So, um, there's a lack of implementation by EU member states of this directive. This is uh, part of the question here. Um, is, how would a new regulation improve this? First of all, um, the, di the difference between a directive and a regulation is that a regulation sets direct rules, which everyone has to do. Even if you have no national implementation whatsoever, the rules still apply. A directive requires implementation. And maybe the implementation is not as full as, as you wish it to be, there could be slightly difference. A, a regulation sets a union-wide, exactly same state of play. A directive is only the minimalistic level. You can go back, uh, uh, you, you can go higher, but you can't go lower than that. Uh, a regulation sets a standard which is everywhere the same. And this, of course, enables international cooperation better because the systems are actually equal in this point. And this is why I'm personally quite in favor of regulations than directive. Directive is a bit, how to say, setting more a direction, a goal. But here you can set a harmonized standard everywhere. And um, if I may continue with a question for you again, Klaus. <laughs> maybe maybe this also brings us, yeah, I'm, I'm also having a look at the time and we're, uh, we're already um, approaching uh, a little bit the end of our discussion today. Um, Klaus, we got a question asking what are the biggest challenges of Eurojust or for Eurojust at the moment? Um, what comes to your mind when you hear this question? There are, of, of course, um, several issues which are of concern for us. The, um, the biggest overall arching uh, issue is digitalization. Here, a huge amount of investment needs to be found in the European Union uh, at Eurojust to create something which is uh, called the digital criminal justice system. Um, we discussed that, especially in the realm of cybercrime, where we need to be uh, on equal keel with the criminals. We need to be modern, faxes, telephones, uh, uh, um, and, and all of these old-fashioned things need to be a, a, a part of the past. Um, just uh, looking at cybercrime, uh, the amount of data you might have to transfer requires a, a robust system and on top a secure system in every country. So it doesn't help very much if, for example, the Italian colleagues could transmit through the Italian systems and then a huge amount of data to Eurojust securely. And it, if it has to go at randomly picking Finland, there is no system to transmit this. So what then? Then you suddenly have to have a, a funny sticker and someone traveling. So where's the game? Um, on top, um, if it comes to, uh, to that, it means the caseload at Eurojust is increasing constantly. I see it at my, my German desk. And we are supposed to be acting till 2027 with the same level of staff as in 2019. That this is illogic, 
um, begs, I would say, no question. So again, the, uh, I have this player and justice, if you want to serve justice, it's not something you do on the cheap. You need the investment. And the investment here flows directly back to our national authorities, that they can investigate properly, taking all kinds of international aspects of their work into account and have no fear that they won't be able to manage it. They will, because they have the helping hand. And this needs to be done properly. And we want to expand. We have 13 other countries uh, on the line for cooperation agreements. So all this requires a hell of a lot of investment. But if the union makes good of its promise to support the security and justice for its citizen, it requires a certain kind of investment in their agency to do their work properly. I think this serves as an excellent uh, closing remark. Thank you very much, Klaus. And uh, yeah, indeed, the, the money spent on this will, uh, as you said, it will flow back to the national authorities and it will uh, eventually then uh, end up with the citizens because it uh, guarantees their safety. Thank you so much, Klaus. Thank you so much, everybody here. Um, we have now reached the uh, end of our morning session, but uh, this does not mean we have reached the end of our virtual open day. Quite the opposite. It's still continuing. Uh, you will now see our Eurojust virtual tour. So a video in uh, which we will give you a look behind the scenes uh, here at of our premises, uh, premises here in The Hague. We will show you uh, not only where we work, but also how we work. So you have heard uh, a lot now about, uh, for example, um, uh, about coordination meetings, about coordination centers, uh, about JITs, joint investigation teams. Um, Stay tuned, then you will get uh, a lot more information on this now in the following minutes. You will also see our beautiful building where we are proud to work here every day for your safety and your security. And uh, after that, um, my HR colleagues will tell you everything about career opportunities at Eurojust. So how can you become a member of Team Eurojust and work together with all those great people here? From my side, thank you very much for tuning in, for joining us today. And now, please stay with us, enjoy the rest of the open day, and first, our virtual tour. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cecilia Torfin, and today I want to welcome you to explore this virtual tour of Eurojust the European Union's Agency for Criminal Justice Cooperation. Created in 2002, Eurojust is located in The Hague, the Netherlands, in the international city of peace and justice. In this beautiful building, which was inaugurated in 2017, around 130 prosecutors and investigative judges from over 30 countries work side by side to tackle all forms of serious cross-border crime. They give hands-on assistance to their colleagues in the national judicial authorities who are working on international criminal investigations and prosecutions, tackling all forms of crime, serious cross-border crime, including terrorism, drug smuggling, human trafficking, cybercrime or economic crime, such as money laundering. So why Eurojust? The European Union is based on freedom, and this is not just an abstract catchphrase, it's a principle that determines our daily lives. The free movement of goods, services, capital and persons gives us the opportunities we need to thrive economically, socially and personally. But to safeguard these principles, two other pillars of the EU are equally important, security and justice. We cannot allow criminals to take advantage of those freedoms. And as crime knows no borders, Europe needs to fight crime across borders as well. In this virtual tour, we offer you the possibility to take a closer look at how we are working and how this agency is set up. The Eurojust building is surrounded by a dune landscape and a water feature, which form a necessary security barrier. Together with the color scheme and materials used inside the building, including a lot of copper, the building intimately reflects the character of the host city, The Hague, a city in the dunes by the sea.
mid-2017, Eurojust moved to its custom-made and permanent premises in the international zone of The Hague. The office building was designed by an integrated design team comprised of Meccano Architects, Royal Haskoning and DS Landscape Architects. It's a purpose-built facility, constructed and owned by the Dutch state and rented to Eurojust. The office building and its premises cover over 18,000 square meters and are home to more than 400 workplaces and dedicated state-of-the-art conference and interpretation facilities. A connected underground parking space of more than 7,000 square meters can house up to 276 cars and 100 bicycles for employees and visitors. It's equipped with a number of electric charging points to stimulate driving electric vehicles to and from work. The building's architecture represents the core values of Eurojust. It's, it's a very, very light building, which doesn't provide just a good working environment, but it also underlines actually the importance of transparency in public administration, which is necessary to achieve justice. The interior layout encourages interaction, collaboration and mutual trust between the key operational stakeholders at Eurojust by facilitating face-to-face -face meetings, one-to-one -one or in a big group, and bringing the different strands of Eurojust together in one place. The use of natural materials, a neutral color palette and a high quality finish in everything results in a pleasant working environment which is perfectly suited to the many nationalities that work. So here we are in the lobby of the Eurojust building and in fact the structure of the building is also reflecting how Eurojust is set up. Here above me we have the low rise of the building and this is where the national members and their teams have their offices. They are senior prosecutors and investigative judges who are seconded from the national judicial authorities and thus not employed by the EU but representing the member states they come from. And usually the secondments to Eurojust last several years, meaning that they get to know each other very well, they build very close collegial relationships as a basis for creating trust and mutual understanding. And this is actually key to a good result, since judicial cooperation between sovereign states requires a thorough understanding of legal frameworks and of legal cultures. Over here, you can take the elevator up to the high-rise part of the building and here about 240 support staff are working in what we call the administration of Eurojust. These are people who are directly employed by the agency and serving the national desks in their work. Judicial cooperation officers are available to help and assist the national representatives in the casework and they also build the centre of expertise in cross-border judicial cooperation that Eurojust forms. The experts also produce best practice reports and organize thematic events, for example, for prosecutors specialized in a particular crime type, which regularly take place here. Other staff members ensure the security of the building, logistical services, IT systems, arrange translations and interpretation services, and ensure, of course, the proper management of budgets and of staff. cases brought before Eurojust involve two or more countries seeking to solve a serious cross-border crime. It starts when a prosecutor or investigative judge identifies a cross-border element in the investigation and contacts the national member of his or her country to get assistance. But beyond that, each criminal case is different and requires an individual approach. Sometimes a rapid response is needed when prosecutors want to act immediately to locate and apprehend suspects. In such cases, they can rely on Eurojust's unique on-call services and contact the national desks to quickly make the right connections with authorities in another country, exchange information, understand the exact legal requirements and prepare the transmission of legal cooperation requests, such as the European arrest warrant, for example, which is the basis to take action. Other investigations last several months or years and they require careful planning, coordination and discussion in which Eurojust and the national desks play a coordinating role. Check out the coordination meeting room and the coordination center videos to find out more. Complex cross-border crime investigations can last several months or years and they require careful planning and coordination and discussion in which Eurojust and the national desks play a coordinating role. 
Let me now take you down to one of the coordination meeting rooms and tell you more about how this work is done. Here we are in one of the secure meeting rooms which are used to hold case-specific coordination meetings. The prosecutor in charge of the case can organize one or several such meetings so that all actors needed in the case can meet face-to-face -face in a secure environment. The number of countries and participants entirely depends on the case and may include judiciary, law enforcement of course, and Europol. The European Union Agency for Law Enforcement Cooperation regularly participates, as well as representations of customs or food security authorities, depending on the crimes committed. And we also regularly have OLAF here, the EU Anti-Fraud Office. They meet here, face to face, or via a secure video conferencing system, to share case information and case files, identify possible parallel investigations and work out which country is best placed to prosecute a suspect. They also prepare the use of judicial cooperation instruments such as the European Arrest Warrant or European Investigation Order. And they also plan the collection of evidence, uh, which is of course very important once the case goes to trial. There is a possibility to have simultaneous interpretation into all EU languages so that each participant can speak his or her own language so that language doesn't become a barrier to understanding each other. Regularly, the countries are also assisted to form a joint investigation team. This is an agreement that enables direct cooperation between judiciary and law enforcement authorities for a specific purpose and a specific period of time. The advantage is that the partners in EGIT can cooperate more effectively, including directly collecting and exchanging evidence, and they can also be present during investigative measures on each other's territories. Complex coordinated actions can also result in the organization of a joint action day in which the countries come together to monitor the joint action day here from our coordination center. Here we are inside the coordination center from which such joint action days can be monitored and supported in real time with the assistance of Eurojust's casework unit. It has secure data connections and makes it possible to centralize continuous contacts between all the judicial authorities and law enforcement involved, immediately analyze the information as it is reported from the field and take the required action. If you would like to step into the shoes of a prosecutor who is working here during one of those joint action days, please play our simulation game. It's a simulation of a coordination center and we actually take you on a journey, step by step, what happens during one of those days. But this time, you're in charge. You have to take the decisions to bring the case to a successful close. Good luck. Now let's talk a bit about how Eurojust is governed. Each member state appoints a national member to Eurojust and together they form Eurojust College. They run the operational work together, but they also take decisions on budget and on other managerial issues, such as the multi-annual programming of the agency. They meet every week in this room, which has an oval-shaped table, and this is very much reflecting the way they take their decisions, which is as a group. They appoint a president who is seated over here and two vice presidents, and they each serve a term of four years. In December 2019, the new Eurojust regulation entered into force and this led to the creation of an executive board, which is supporting the college in its decision-making procedures and where the European Commission is also taking part. The 240 staff who are working in the administration of Eurojust are reporting to an administrative director. Since crime doesn't stop at EU borders, Eurojust has developed a cohesive international network that grants prosecutors around the European Union access to more than 50 jurisdictions worldwide. The agency has signed cooperation agreements with dozens of non-EU states, several of which have seconded liaison prosecutors to Eurojust. They can work closely together on cases with the national members from their counterparts in the college. 
Eurojust also works closely with other EU agencies and partners that support the various stages in the criminal justice chain, including law enforcement and anti-fraud bodies, and houses the secretariats of other key networks supporting judicial authorities at EU level, including the European Judicial Network, the EU Genocide Network, and a network that specifically supports experts on joint investigation teams. One of the artworks created especially for Eurojust stands outside of the building. It's a large bronze statue by Spanish sculptor Fernando Sanchez Castillo. It's called Reflection and it portrays a woman seated on a rock in a position similar to that of Rodin's thinker. As a way to celebrate the cultural diversity at Eurojust, the EU member state that holds the rotating EU presidency is also invited to offer a display of pieces of art in the Eurojust building. Thank you very much for joining me on this virtual tour of Eurojust and I hope you have enjoyed finding out a little bit about what we do here. If you're curious about knowing more, please explore our website for press releases, information on our operational results and all sorts of reports and fact sheets. You can also follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube. And we also have a quarterly newsletter that you can receive by email. Finally, if you're interested in coming and visiting us in person, you can request a visit, a study visit via our website. Thank you again and hope to see you soon.